welcome to the, to the stage uh, uh, Professor Rus Gassers, uh, who is the track leader for the Digital Natives track for the keynote. I told you that today is the day of the keynotes. Uh, the track will go on uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. And uh, therefore, if you're interested in the tr Digital Natives track, look for Urs Gasser and he's your man. Thank you so much. First of all, Massimo, this was fantastic. I'm very uh, excited about your presentation and the project. I think uh, it filled the room full of good waves and entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I'm also thrilled, actually, to welcome you to this first um, plenary session, this thematic track focusing on youth, digital technologies, and the future of universities. I will briefly introduce the topic uh, and then turn over to our keynote speaker. So I think the starting point for this thematic track goes back to what Retore uh, Profumo mentioned this morning, that there is a population of young people that has entered university uh, out there um, that is deeply immersed in digital technologies in general and the internet in particular. By the age that a uh, young person today enters university, um, this person has accumulated somewhere between 15 and 20,000 hours of online experience. Um, that's the equivalent of what you would spend to become a professional musician. Now, of course, this figure alone is impressive, but it's only uh, part of the illustration um, to show how relevant the internet has become for young people and their everyday lives. Of course, in a way more important is what happens during this, these 15,000 or 20,000 hours online um, what does the internet mean for the formation of identity, for instance? Uh, what does it mean for, for learning, for creativity, for entrepreneurship, as you just uh, got illustrated very impressively? I think from the perspective of this panel and this track, um, there are a series uh, of questions we may ask. I would just like to highlight four, and I'm sure that John and, and uh, then also Marco will come. Uh, will add additional questions and maybe also refine them. I think the first one is really how does information seeking look like uh, in a digital age, especially looking at digital natives. Um, John may uh, report on that um, later on. Uh, as it turns out, young people, if they have an information need, they don't necessarily go to university libraries in the first place, uh, obviously, they would start with a Google search and uh, would uh, eventually turn uh, to Wikipedia. The second question is, uh, what are the information processing habits of, of young people, of digital natives? Um, is it true, for instance, that digital natives are media multitaskers? And what are the challenges associated with that? We, uh, heard this morning already about the limited attention span and Charlie uh, pointed out that it may be challenging to have people um, in the classroom doing several things at the same time. What are the implications for learning but also teaching? The third cluster of issues and questions is how do young people actually share information and knowledge um, both in academic settings but also in their social lives online? What are again um, the challenges here, uh, Professor Rodota in his excellent keynote identified one challenge that I haven't thought about, uh, which is the challenge for faculty members to keep up uh, with actually the new insights or you know, proposed insights that um, students would present to them. Uh, but also, of course, what are the opportunities? Again, I think it's both about the challenges and opportunities that we would like to address um, in this thematic track. In the opportunity zone, certainly, how can we use um, social media in uh, learning environments in the classroom to make learning uh, more exciting, to uh, make learning more productive? So I think uh, this is an important cluster of questions. Um, a fourth question that I want to um, put on the table is, um, 
digital natives are themselves increasingly content producers. They are no longer passive uh, users or receivers of information, but creative re-users. Now, how do these practices, practices of um, content creation online translate into the development of certain skills and literacies um, that then may shape learning experiences also in institutional contexts such as universities. I hope you'll have a chance to talk about that. Uh, information quality, for instance, is a keyword there where you see uh, how uh, content creation, say on Facebook, in Facebook environments or, or in game environments, um, may then actually um, lead to certain skills that are also well relevant in more traditional institutional um, settings such as universities. So these are just four questions that our track today and tomorrow uh, will address. Um, the starting point, as you can take, is uh, a phenomenological perspective looking at the media usage habits of digital natives. But of course, there is also a normative dimension to all of that. It's not just descriptive. Uh, I think there are important issues and questions at stake. How do we, as educators, respond to some of these changes in information uh, behavior and changes how learning happens today. What are the trends and habits that universities should embrace and build upon? But then also, of course, what are the traits and trajectories um, where our institutions of learning and education should probably uh, resist and um, give some pushback? In other, word, in other words, What's the future role of university and universities in reshaping the ways in which young people um, relate to information, communicate with each other, share knowledge, and define ultimately their relation uh, to social institutions? So you see this uh, just by way of introduction, uh, a few of the issues and questions uh, that we have to deal with in this particular track. And of course, there is no one better than my dear colleague and friend, Professor John Palfrey of Harvard Law School to address these issues. Um, John is not only a professor at Harvard Law School, he's also a vice dean uh, and the head of library. Uh, he's very well positioned uh, to answer not only um, some of the questions as, you know, what the data suggests, how young people are using media, but then also to discuss, address, and explore together with all of us, I hope, um, the more challenging normative questions. With that, John, over to you. hosted us, thank you, this is good to be amplified, Juan Carlos, you have hosted us in a way I think that expresses exactly the network and the desire of this event to bring together a group of people from wherever we have been gathered in the world, um, physically here to Torino, but at the same time you have created an event that brings this network together in cyberspace. If you follow on Twitter, the Pound Communia page, of course, you see in this uh, environment that you've created the conversation in both spaces and I think you've given life to this idea of networking uh, a university and a learning environment uh, in the particular way that I hope we will all do uh, in the spirit of inquiry over the next three days and ultimately uh, what we are here um, to do. Um, I want to lean into this idea of redesigning the university for a networked age and to do it with respect to the learning habits of young people, digital natives, as um, Ursa and I have been talking about it. Um, there is a wonderful track led by Antoine Picon and uh, Jeff Huang later where we'll talk about uh, specific architectures. And I want to tie this session of digital natives specifically to that architectures, which is to say, if we were to rethink what a university ought to be or what a learning environment broadly ought to be in a digital plus era. This is part of the argument I will make. It's not purely digital, it's not purely analog, but a digital plus era. How would we design it? What would that architecture look like? What would the Politecnico di Torino, when the Olympics comes, um, what would it look like in this environment um, if we were to design it from the ground up knowing that we have these hybrid uh, environments uh, in mind? And that is the ultimate premise. 
I start often when I think about this particular question in preparing for this lecture um, with an image that comes from the Harvard Law School Library. Delighted to have some colleagues here from Harvard Law School and, and our library in particular. Um, I think nobody in the room would guess what this is, perhaps save Mr. Fisher in the front row. Um, this is the personal library of a jurist in American history, an important man, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was both professor at the Harvard Law School and a member of our Supreme Court. And this was the learning environment that he created for himself. This is his personal library. And to me, when I see this personal library of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., um, I think of uh, the great thoughts that one would come up with here. You would think about the article he wrote, The Path of the Law, which is an important piece in legal scholarship. You think about the great opinions uh, that he wrote, some of which um, we don't think are so great anymore, but they were important. And uh, the, the environment that he created for himself was this one surrounded by books, one that was contemplative uh, in a sense, but also um, clearly uh, it had all of the masters around him in a way. And for me, the heuristic, in a way, is how do we create that level of learning environment in a digital plus era? What does it look like to create the learning environment for our students that would lead them to think um, in the same way uh, that Holmes did? And what can we know about these young people that will help us to do that design work? So I want to um, turn next, though, to a problem, a problem that relates to the scholarship and to invite you into this, uh, into a little debate. So as Urs mentioned, uh, and as previous speakers have led us to see, um, there's a big conversation going on about whether kids these days are different. Um, one uh, of two polls um, takes uh, a pure form of this argument. The pure form is to say that young people are fundamentally different from those who came before. They are digital natives. They have grown up in a world where they learn in different ways. They relate to one another in completely different ways, the social. They are constantly connected to these technologies, that they in fact relate also to institutions, politics, business, and so forth in fundamentally new ways. This is most uh, notably made as an argument by a guy named Mark Prensky, who uh, coined this term, digital natives. Um, and that's the strong form uh, of the argument on one side. Um, this argument, though, has been uh, discredited, or it's been at least challenged by the dominant academic view. The dominant academic view at the moment of researchers um, skews very far in the other direction. There's in fact a deep skepticism about this theory of digital natives. In fact, researchers to a person, perhaps Urs and I um, as uh, the only exceptions to this, really dislike this term, digital natives, really dislike it because it seems to give a sense of essentialism, that because they have grown up in a particular moment that they all act the same way that this is a faulty way to look at the world, that kids, in fact, are no different than kids um, that came before, that kids, in fact, learn exactly the same way, um, just in a new environment, that this is entirely a constructed phenomenon, and that what we are doing is to uh, make kids into something that they aren't. We are, in fact, trying to celebrate them in a way that is uh, unhelpful to schools. And, in fact, if we go down the path of saying we need to rethink everything in light of what these young people do and how they learn, that we will get it entirely wrong. And they point back to previous changes in technology, um, for instance, the radio here in the land of Marconi, a wonderful um, moment to be able to thank you for the uh, Nobel Prize winning um, uh, gentleman who gave us this great communications breakthrough uh, to uh, television and so forth. We didn't upend the university completely when radio came along or television, right? We didn't go to a pure distance mode. There were discussions of this if you go back and read the literature. Um, and in fact, if we had skewed too far away from the physical uh, experience of education that we would have made a huge mistake. So in the recent intellectual history of this term, you have these two poles. Um, and when Urs and I uh, took on the job of uh, studying this topic and writing a book, um, we decided that what we would do is to embrace the term digital natives. We would not resist it, we would embrace it. Why? When we went to the Congress to testify about these topics, about child safety or how kids learn, this was a term that resonated. It resonated for Congress people. It resonated for parents and teachers confused about this topic. It was something that had cultural resonance. So we decided the idea would be to reclaim it, and to reclaim it by saying it's not a generation, but instead it's a population of kids. It's a group of kids within uh, the world who use these technologies in a particular way, and it's something that continues to evolve. So the argument uh, that we try to make around digital natives is, yes, there is a phenomenon such as the digital native, 
Um, but it's not everyone. So how do we define it? Um, we define it by a few characteristics and then um, we'll describe some attributes that I think are enduring attributes of the, this group. Um, so one is to say there's presumably some date involved here. We chose 1980. This is the date at which uh, bulletin board systems and other social technologies came on. So we decided that um, anyone born after 1980 would be possibly in this group. So how many people born after 1980 here? Not me, but all right, about six, ten, something like that out of a few hundred. Aha, uh -huh, yes, of course, Marco, you get, you get the next word, uh, importantly. Um, so we chose this date somewhat arbitrarily. Um, the second was to say that these digital natives had to have access to the technology, and here we are in this global environment. Of course, the crucial point being that there is still a digital divide, right? We know that only about 1.3, maybe closer to 2 billion people have access to this kind of technology in the world, the um, sort of uh, uh, fast connection on a big PC. Um, and then if you add in uh, the kind that is preferred by lots of kids, the mobile technology, you get another maybe 3 billion people have something like this. Um, but still there are 6.8 billion people on the planet. We know there's a digital divide, so it can't be that everyone born after 1980 is a digital native. And then the final characteristic, and the most important one, the most important one for us as teachers in universities or those designing universities is the notion of having the skills to use them. So there's extensive research that shows that there's a very broad band of sophistication of usage of these technologies. And I think this is an essential fact for us. Our colleagues Esther Hargitay uh, and Henry Jenkins both call this the participation gap. The gap between those may have been born accident of history after a certain date, who have access to the technology, accident of history that they're born in a rich town like Torino, but they don't have the ability to use it very well. They're not supported in this way. They use it in naive ways. They use it not in sophisticated ways. And it runs all the way up to Marco. Marco, who is the truest form of this phenomenon, as we'll learn, someone who has extraordinary skill with these technologies, who can do wonderful things. And I think it's somewhere in between um, these poles that we uh, ought to come out. Not that all of the young people out there in the world are digital natives, not that there's a generation, um, but that there is a phenomenon and it's something that we can study empirically and learn what the attributes are. I think it's important also to note that it's not just kids who use technology in these extraordinarily sophisticated ways. So Massimo gave us this sense of wonder about Arduino. Um, clearly he has all of those skills, presumably born after 1980 or before 1980, but um, no doubt the same set of skills as these kids in many respects. That just as there are digital natives and digital immigrants, that we should think too of the digital settlers, those who were there at the beginning of the technologies and who in fact have constructed and built them, the leaders um, like Massimo who are the digital settlers. Um, another digital settler, does anyone know whose hands these are? I'll pause, Obama. It's just, to me amazing that you can put up on a screen a slide of a pair of hands anywhere in the world and everyone knows that that's President Obama's pair of hands, the most famous pair of hands in the world. Um, president Obama, when he ran for election uh, to become President of the United States, there's a story that happened during the campaign. He was standing beside a soccer field as his uh, girls played soccer and he was on his Blackberry, you know, typing something to his campaign manager um, and his wife comes along and slaps it out of his hand um, saying, you can't be photographed, you know, watched, you know, doing your Blackberry when you're supposed to be watching soccer. Um, and he's continued to have this Crackberry addiction as many of us do, where, where's your Blackberry, where is it, you know, you don't lose it and somehow continues to have this in the White House. So I think it's important to note that even those born well before 1980 sometimes have just as much in the way of skills and and of course we are constantly um, modeling it. Um, I can't resist one more photo of our president. Um, this is a picture um, that is meant to promote libraries. As you can imagine, President Obama during law school uh, in a library environment, if you can see down below, it says, where all the cool kids hang out. I think this is a good aspiration for us to create libraries and universities, even in a digital age, even, Charlie, if the library for the university is cyberspace. I'm not yet convinced, we will come back to this, um, that we create these environments. Um, of this sort. So I want to pause for one second. I was, uh, in preparing for this lecture, uh, struck by the irony of talking about how young people learn in more interactive and different ways, uh, in some cases of giving a lecture at a conference of this, and seemed too rich, too rich an irony to be the one person standing on the stage talking about it, um, and that much of what we study is, of course, peer-produced, that we um, engage this idea that um, it is not only um, the one person on the stage who knows something, but it's the group. Um, and of course, in this particular project, um, the person who uh, I've learned most from, we are all um, freshmen, I'm still a freshman, plainly, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, is Urs Gasser. 
Uh, and I wonder, Urs, if you would um, join me up here. I'm going to um, bring you into the lecture to, uh, to make it uh, somewhat more interactive, and I'm going to pose to you some secret questions. No, up, up, up. You have to come up, and do you need a you need a mic? And Marco, you're next after this one. All right, Urs. Here you go. But yeah. This gives me the opportunity to tell you that, sh that you should slow down a little bit. Uh, For the translation, thank you, I will do, that's very good. Um, so you can start modeling for me the slower means of talking. Great, excellent, in your European way. Um, so the first question I have is we made this conscious choice, a conscious choice to talk about digital natives as the topic. We've gotten a lot of abuse, having written a book, Born Digital, where we use this term, uh, that we were on that first poll, the poll of saying it's essentially something that um, uh, is not, uh, di it, that is fundamentally different from what came before. But of course we try to reclaim the term and to do something different. So a few years after doing it, did we get it wrong in some respects? Do you regret this decision of embracing the term digital natives now that we've seen in fact not just the pushback to an argument but also the development of cyberspace since? It's a hard question. Um, I do not regret it. Uh, I think there is certainly a perception issue that we could have addressed in other ways than we did and that is uh, I think the book that we wrote focused on, on, on change so I mean the main interest was exactly what is different about um, digital natives or this population actually that is so deeply immersed in, in digital technologies and I think always when you focus on, on change uh, that you basically uh, of course not make the same strong argument for the things that remain consistent and constant over time so I can see why we get pushback on that side arguing well you, you didn't you suggest everything is different but actually it is not but we have never said everything is different but a second issue that I'm more concerned about is well there is research out there too right uh, that is solid and that we have reviewed and hopefully also contributed to that actually shows there are differences in information seeking behavior in information processing some of the things I mentioned and even more strikingly in the recent past we have a a number of uh, neuroscientists and neurobiologists actually arguing that even like the brain structure, the way we are hardwired, in other words, uh, will change uh, through extensive use uh, of online media. So I'm not convinced in a way that um, our argument isn't a sound one, especially uh, if it's seen as a starting point of a conversation, uh, also kind of in the public fora that you mentioned, be it in Congress, be it here, talking about the future of universities. And therefore, I still believe it's helpful, although, of course, we will learn more over time and have a more granular sense uh, of, you know, the differences, what is really new, what is kind of uh, remains there. Very helpful. Thank you. I have more for you in a minute, so don't go too far. Don't go too far. Yeah, yeah, seats is good. Um, so I will take this cue trying to be slower, sorry, um, to the wonderful translators in back, uh, to talk about, in fact, the findings of the research, the research that we have done as uh, people studying this, but also building on the shoulders of giants, those who have studied this uh, before. Um, I'll talk about a few of the attributes that make us think that it's worth talking about a population. So the first of them, we actually get to through the notion of identity, um, but I think it's a deeper and more fundamental point for universities about convergence of environments. So um, one of the questions that we would ask kids was the way in which they projected themselves in the world. How did they create their identity? And what we had in mind, of course, was that they would describe to us the way in which they uh, chose certain clothes to wear. Marco chooses certain clothes to wear today, sneakers and a uh, nice white shirt. This conveys something about who he is. You might imagine the young woman going to a ball and putting on a more uh, fancy dress and so forth, constructing a physical identity. And at the same time, they would describe to us the creation of an identity in Facebook, a creation of an identity in the social environments online that they uh, inhabit and through the texting and so forth that they make. Um, and it turns out that this was not a possible question for them to answer. So yes, of course they did all these things. They chose the certain clothes they wore each day and they chose what picture to upload to Facebook, what is their profile picture and so forth. Um, but the, what was confounding to them 
was that it was a converged environment. It was just a mesh. It wasn't online life and offline life. It was just life. And so if when we think about building a library, we think about it as a physical space on the one hand and then a virtual space separately, we create the library website, we're making a mistake. We're making a mistake about the convergence of these two environments. The learning environment is not separately the physical and the virtual, it's the same. So Juan Carlos, back to your conference design, the notion that there's a Twitter conversation going on right now, as well as this conversation going on right now, I think is an essential point that we learn um, from these digital natives. I think deeply related to this when we talk about identities, um, they describe also how the creation of identities is not just in text, it's not just in what they write, but it's in the characters that they create. It's in the avatars and so forth that they go around through this um, digital aspect of their converged lifestyle with. Um, this is an example from Second Life. It's more extreme in Second Life. But the lowest common denominator in the research is in fact gaming. So we talked about that participation gap where the richest kids have the most sophisticated skills, the least rich kids tend to have the least sophisticated skills. Um, but it turns out that gaming uh, is a flattener. Everybody, depending on, it uh, doesn't matter, their socioeconomic status, race, class, gender, and so forth, everybody is involved in gaming. This is a remarkable fact that we will track uh, through the session later. And much of what happens in gaming is this identity play, that young people come home at the end of a day, throw off the backpack, and then immerse themselves in this uh, second environment of gaming, uh, which is much about creating uh, and maintaining identity. Second factor that establishes the notion of this population of digital natives um, is the idea of not doing just one thing at a time but doing multiple things at once. Uh, as we're said, there are opportunities and there are challenges, of course, to this. Uh, Charlie Nesson this morning mentioned the problem of the laptop in the classroom and I think it's most uh, fundamentally described by this, this notion of doing more than one thing at a time. So if this were a classroom at the Harvard Law School, um, this would not be the experience of the teacher, by and large. Most of you are, in fact, looking at me. It's actually sort of awkward that you're looking at me because students are usually looking into their laptops. They're usually looking down, doing something else, um, that there is another conversation happening at the same time, this notion of uh, multitasking. Um, you see it also in the, uh, the, um, uh, the dinner table where you have a conversation going on and the kid is trying to text under the table and so forth. You see it with those earbuds as they walk across the street and they're uh, nearly getting hit at all times. They have multiple things going at once. And Urs mentioned earlier this idea of 15 to 20,000 hours mediated by these technologies. Uh, one other study uh, in the United States by the Kaiser Family Foundation argued that kids spend as much as 50 hours a week mediated by these technologies, more than a full-time job, according to the newspapers. Um, but partly what explains this is that they're doing more than one thing at a time. They might be watching television while also listening to music, while also doing their homework, while also chatting to somebody else. It's not good or bad, I just describe it as a fact. And a fact that we have to decide whether we want to embrace as universities. Do we bring the laptop in the classroom and make the most of it? Um, do we resist it or do we do something in between? But I think this is a second essential fact uh, of digital natives. Third uh, essential fact um, is the way in which they relate to media that they presume that the media will be in a format that is digital in the first instance rather than in an analog form. And I think this presents also opportunities and challenges. So in one case, um, you think about images. Uh, as an example, I have a four-year-old daughter. She's um, named Emmeline. And we went on vacation recently. And on vacation, we forgot our camera, the regular cam digital camera. So we bought a disposable one, which is a regular camera. And she took those pictures of kids. The, the kids take like people's feet and you know, backsides and so forth, bad pictures. And she would flip them over and say, Daddy, where are the pictures? She was assuming she could go and delete the pictures that were on the back of the phone because, or the back of the camera. She'd never had the experience that you take a roll of film, you bring it to a store, you then uh, get it, wait three days and get it um, uh, brought back. She didn't have the experience of the analog image. Her presumption was that it was in a digital form. You could then do something with it. You could make something with it, make it more social uh, and so forth. If you think about music, it's the same story in a way. It's not a surprise that most record stores have uh, no longer um, uh, offer things, that iTunes has become the biggest retailer. Of course, the presumption is that audio is in a malleable form, it's in an MP3 form, that YouTube has become the number two search engine in the world uh, for video and so forth. 
even print is going in the same direction in some respects, but not in all. And this is an important fact, I think, to put on the table. So newspapers, at least in the United States, are feeling the challenge. They're feeling the challenge of uh, not as many readers among young people, and it's true. I will be interested in whether Marco is a newspaper reader. Maybe because you have La Stampa, you have a wonderful newspaper that everybody reads it still. Um, but with our young people, they're not reading the New York Times uh, in the morning in the same format. They get it online and in digital format. Um, even journal articles, they get uh, in an online form. But the one anomaly, and I think it's useful to note the one anomaly, is the book. That if you ask our students at Harvard or students in broader surveys, if you have a long form argument, a book like this, how do you want to enjoy it? And they still say, I want the book, the hard copy book. I want to open it and touch it and put it in my bag and so forth. And when you look at the sales of uh, the Kindle or the Nook or the iPad, the readers, um, they haven't spiked among kids. It's not uh, kids rushing out to get these devices. And when you ask them, why do you like the book in this format, they say the same thing as adults. They say, the bed, the bath, and the beach. That I like to use it in these ways that are comfortable and that I love it as a, as a format. This is the one very important anomaly in the story of digital media uh, and youth. And as we'll explore, of course, this is not only that they come in this format, but that you can do something with them. You, in fact, can use them in these social ways. You can upload them. The example of Wikipedia that Charlie uh, created, I think, is the best one, that knowledge is social um, and is something that you can, in fact, edit um, back and forth. Uh, and the last attribute to hit um, here is this notion that Massimo mentioned about creativity in young people. Uh, and we're here on deck for uh, a comment in a moment, just giving you, teeing you up. Um, one example of this, uh, academics love the idea that we've gone from a culture of kids who are consumers of information to some who are creators. Um, and we found in our research that it is sometimes true, but not always true, that there's still a large segment of the population that we've seen um, whose creativity online is very, very limited. It's limited to creating a Facebook page or another social network page. The kinds of kids who are doing the most creative things, Massimo's creators, are still a small percentage of the kids, the most sophisticated and so forth, the, the smartest. Um, we decided to try to tap into these as we did our research. Um, we needed a logo for the Digital Native project. Um, and so we decided to do a contest. We put a note up on the internet and said, please give us a uh, logo for our contest. I think we offered no more than the glory of doing it. Um, but we got 176 entries from kids. Um, the winning entry, in fact, um, was this one uh, from a boy named Brandon Cody. We didn't know Brandon Cody. Uh, he's from England. Um, Brandon Cody was going to win no matter what. He gave us 32 entries. Um, the good part is he gave us a pretty good one. Um, but the, the essential premise was that in an internet era, the uh, ability to put a little signal up in cyberspace uh, and to have a whole bunch of kids come back and give you something very creative and effective, um, perhaps for no more than the glory of doing it, um, struck us as something distinctive. So worse, I'm coming back to you if that's okay. Um, against the backdrop of these uh, attributes, one of the most important one, of course, is, is it in fact the case that our digital natives are more creative than kids who came before? So this is one of the pushbacks on the argument about essentialism and digital natives, that in fact it's not the case. Kids are just as creative as they were before, no more, no less. And in this environment, um, we are uh, making a mistake if we uh, pretend that they can do something that they couldn't do before. Um, how do you see this, uh, this issue of creativity? Is it something to build from, or is it something that uh, is overstated? All these hard questions. Yeah. Um, That's why I have nothing else to say on them, yeah, so I give it to you. Well, first of all, I think one of the points we need to make is the distinction between creativity and originality. So one of the arguments we often hear is um, that much of the content that is produced, take a Facebook or, or um, a MySpace update, that this content that counts as user-created content is not particularly creative or innovative. Um, so. I think that's the first distinction to make. Now, I would say, fair enough, kids have always been creative. They, my kids are drawing, they like to draw a lot, and they also use the computer and also uh, do creative stuff on the computer. So um, I would argue, however, that the potential that we have in terms of what is possible for creativity uh, has changed quite a bit through digital technologies. 
um, looking at uh, some of the videos, for instance, we run a video contest uh, in association with our book. Some of the things we've seen there uh, is just really amazing, uh, uh, both in terms of the quality of work, but also in terms of um, participation and so forth. So I would be very optimistic, and I think the real question before us is not so much is it you know, the current state of play, are kids more creative or is it more or less the same as in previous years? It's the question, how can we draft policies to open up and encourage um, youth to be creative uh, also in traditional institutions such as universities? And I know that you um, are in the process of creating a lab, for instance, at the library. We, of course, at the Berkman Center um, uh, have also a lab and, and thinking about youth involvement in that in a very traditional, formal setting, of course, and I think that's the way to go, so to um, craft policies and create spaces and places um, that encourage uh, creative expression. Excellent. Thank sense? you. It's very good. It's very good. Better than I would have done. Um, I would add one more piece to the creativity, um, and then, Marco, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Um, one other piece to the creativity is it's not just about creating the content in the form of videos, um, not just content in the form of educational materials and so forth, but it's also the code itself. This was a crucial point, I think, um, of Massimo's a moment ago, that the ability to tinker with the code, to create, in fact, the technologies with which people learn is an essential piece of the story. That if you think about the Web 2.0, the social network technologies, many of them were created by kids. They were created by Chad Hurley um, as an undergraduate creating YouTube. It was Sean Fanning making the disruptive Napster. It was Mark Zuckerberg creating the disruptive Facebook and so forth. Kids are creating these technologies with which they are learning and creating uh, something that is uh, frankly different as a potential learning environment. So, yes, sir. Yes, of course. And then, Marco, you're next. So now I have more time to think about your question. And here is one, I think, uh, aspect in addition to what you just mentioned. It's also that, of course, much of the content that is um, created uh, is created in a peer um, uh, situation, right? Quite often you would have friends reading, reviewing, clicking on uh, the things you created, be it even on a Facebook uh, uh, status update. And I think there are important skills, as research indicates, associated with that uh, type of creativity. So it's not only to be creative in the first place and produce something new, but it's actually learning also uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of social skills, in terms of information literacy and media literacy. And this may actually be something new as opposed to Ananda, my daughter, sitting at the table drawing uh -huh. a nice house, right? Because it's deeply in a social, embedded in a social context. So that's just kind of... That's uh, excellent. Thank you. And speaking of embedded in a social context, we have Marco, uh, the founder, in fact, of something called the Oil Project. I hope that you will um, tell us some about it. There's a, uh, a microphone there. Um, I wanted to pause at this point, which is uh, partway through. Um, He's a digital native. Yeah, you are? All right. He embraces the term. This is a digital native. Um, they are real. You can touch them. <laughs> um, here comes the spotlight. Uh, so, in the spirit of peer review and, and criticism, we've uh, described a series of attributes. And one of the more difficult things is to describe the series of attributes about the subject of your research, in fact, the object, the people who are doing it. Um, so one question would be, does this sound right? These descriptors of uh, youth, of which, you, uh, of which you're one, uh, have we gotten it right? Or would you critique, in fact, how we describe the attributes of digital natives? And uh, from there, are there things that we as universities um, ought to be doing that we're not? Are we getting wrong, in fact, how we interpret these data uh, that we've been collecting? Thank you. Uh, what, I, what I care most is to highlight that uh, being digital native doesn't mean just being good at using technologies. And indeed, I, I appreciated very much the, the second part of the speech when we talked about digital identity and multitasking stuff and uh, the, the peer producing uh, things. Uh, for example, in Italy now, we, we heard about digital natives when we talk about uh, kids of two moms uh, who managed to use iPads without using instructions. But uh, that's, there is nothing special at all in that because just, I mean, kids are, can quickly learning, can quickly learn and that's not a news. I mean, uh, Egyptian kids, maybe they, they were good at climbing uh, 
pyramids without uh, reading instructions. So um, the social aspects are the one we we should uh, care most. And uh, in, in in my experience, uh, I'm talking about this little school, uh, online school uh, we have built. Uh, Yes, the news, it's quite new that you can learn by the computer, staying at home, but the greatest thing is that you can do that uh, with the peer system we were talking about before. And that means that the student of a lesson is also the teacher of the other, and that's not about technology, that's about the way we really perceive uh, instructions and, uh, and learning. And from these points of view, I think that a digital native is someone who has a strange uh, relation with authorities, uh, uh, information authorities. Uh, first, you talked about newspapers, and yes, we are reading that uh, uh, digital natives are, are not reading so much newspapers and so on. That's why a digital native is a, is a person who won't who will say, will never say, uh, that's true because uh, BBC News said that. That's, that's a sentence that we will never heard by a digital native because, because we are born and we are growing up with a so complex system of information uh, and authorities that that doesn't mean anything, BBC News or something else. And that's not just, that's not a good, good aspect, uh, <laughs> totally. I mean, uh, we, have, we have really lots of bad aspects about that. For example, we have uh, in Italy uh, lots of guys on Facebook uh, who are uh, protesting uh, with uh, laws uh, that are already being rejected. I read yesterday on a friend of mine on Facebook, oh my God, that law is it's so dangerous, but there is no, what, does I, what do I mean? The problem is that you have uh, from the information overload stuff, which is produced from the, the peer production, you have all the problem about uh, uh, fact checking and things like that. So um, we really have to work a lot about these aspects. But focusing on the social aspects like this is the, is the first step. So, uh, in a few words, uh, um, lots of sources with a strange uh, perception of authorities, um, different kind of sources, images, uh, videos, what, what we have already said, basically. And the fourth one is a different uh, perception of time. You know, instead of reading a book for an hour, you have uh, this... Uh, these animals, these digital natives who are reading uh, uh, lots of pages of different uh, web pages, books, uh, uh, magazines, maybe without understanding anything, but that's not definitely wrong. Also about that we have to, we, uh, you <laughs> who, are, um, who are scholars, you should doing really resources, uh, lots of resources, sorry for my English, uh, because it's not true that if you spend lots of time reading different things instead of uh, the, the novel from the, the 18th century, that's, that's worse. I don't know. We have to... Extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, I would echo, I think, this key point that you make about a different relationship to authority and hierarchy. This, of course, echoes our uh, wonderful first keynote, uh, our colleague from Rome, who made the argument that universities may be at risk, right, in this environment in which hierarchies are being broken down in different ways. So the hierarchies may look like institutions in business, the record industry, the newspaper industry, the telecommunications industry, but it may also be the industry that we're in as universities and that we should bear in mind, of course, um, that these same things we study in other industries may come back to us. Um, and you mentioned, of course, what some of those threats are. Um, it's important to note these are not all wonderful things that are happening relative to uh, the practices of digital natives. Uh, one that we worry about, particularly in schools, is the credibility of information. The idea that you could get information from all of these different sources, and in fact, are there other things going on, hidden influences uh, in those materials, where it's not the one authoritative uh, source, but it's many uh, potential sources. Um, another one that we hear about consistently is the environment in which you live being one in which there's an overload of information. 
that if one tried to experience this conference in all of its manifestations, you tried to be here but also be online, to listen to the Twitter stream, to listen to the Italian as well as the English, that you might get overloaded. This is another of those challenges I think that we face um, in university. Um, and then last, uh, there are many others, but um, our challenges associated with intellectual property. The notion that uh, in some cases the rules are extremely complex as to how kids can use these materials that they wish to use in the learning environment or that we as libraries, for instance, wish to put online in Charlie's library in the sky. If we're trying to make all of our libraries uh, be one in a digital sense, um, we're restricted greatly by rules and intellectual property. Um, and many of the things that we wish for kids to be able to do are very complicated. And in fact, they then don't do them. So we um, face a bunch of issues. Um, I want to end my part by turning back to the university and saying, how should we respond to um, this challenge, um, this challenge associated with how young people are learning? And I'm positing that at least some young people are learning differently in these important ways. Um, and it's against the backdrop, of course, of uh, an environment in which we have less money as universities than we had a few years ago. It's always the case that if what we could do is to build the cyber environment, have a cyber strategy in Charlie's Nesson's terms to put on top of existing universities, it wouldn't be so hard. I think the harder question is, given that we have to do it with less money, um, how do we turn? How do we prioritize and focus on it? And I would urge us, as we go through this track, to come back to the essential functions of university and to say, what are those things that we need to accomplish? And how, in a way, can the cyber strategy help us do it better? How can we lean into the opportunities associated with these technologies um, and mitigate those drawbacks? Those are teaching and scholarship and learning, of course. But I add Juan Carlos's uh, important addition of civic activism uh, and citizenship, um, two things I think that are associated often with how young people use these technologies. We need to do it in an environment, of course, in which there's greater connectivity globally. The notion that um, there's so much more to learn in this global form of cyberspace um, in our field of law to understand the extraordinary exploding Chinese legal system, which has gone from two law schools 30 years ago to 600 law schools today. If we as a law school based in Italy or in the United States um, forget the fact that there's this connectivity uh, to an extraordinary uh, exploding story in China and elsewhere, uh, we're missing uh, an opportunity. We're missing, I think, also uh, an important uh, issue. If we forget some of these challenges I noted before, if we don't focus on the extent to which too much information, TMI in the US term, um, may drive our students crazy, that there are uh, experiences in which we may need to reintroduce contemplative spaces uh, in the sense of parenting. I'm often struck by the need to tell my kids to turn off the computer and kick them outside so they play soccer or football. They do something other than be online. And I think in universities, we have to think about spaces also in terms of reintroducing the kinds of long-form thinking and contemplation um, that have uh, been important previously. And I want to end by uh, recalling the idea of design and the importance of uh, designing for this digital Age. I think right now what we've done um, to steal an Escher image is to create a very, very complex environment for kids. A complex environment because I think we haven't yet figured out the notion that um, these two environments are combined, the physical and the virtual. We haven't yet done what I think is the essential hard work and which I hope we can get done some of in this conference. Um, so Juan Carlos, I um, recall your question to Charlie of how will we know of communia being a success uh, in this way? How will we know if we have made some progress? Um, and I would put to us the job of the architect, that if we were to build a new building, this is the Harvard Law School uh, library and classroom building called Langdell. If we were to build a new one here in uh, Turin, New Polytechnico, um, we probably would begin by consulting an architect and putting in the room people who understand the emphasis of what we're trying to accomplish, the way in which we are trying to teach and for whom we are trying to teach. Uh, perhaps a design charrette, an uh, environment in which you bring these people together. I would argue that we haven't done the same thing in this digital plus era. We haven't done the design work of trying to think about what does a university or a classroom 
or a library or a dorm, the constituent parts. What does it look like if it's a hybrid learning environment? A learning environment in the sense that sometimes in a library, someone walks in to request a book and you get it off the shelf and you go read it uh, within the classical confines of a beautiful room. But at least half of the time, the student comes in your virtual front door. At least half of the time, the student comes to your website to find the information. And actually, most of the time, they don't come to you first. Most of the time, we know from our data, they go to Google first. And they look for something there, and they go to Wikipedia, they go to Amazon and elsewhere. If they come back to your website, you're lucky. That's the environment in which they're learning. And I think that hybrid environment is what we have to design for. And I think the same goes for the classroom. This goes back to earlier comments as well. Much of the time, kids come into our learning environment um, and we're able to use the Socratic method to teach them or give them a lecture or have a seminar in which we're learning together. But so much of learning is also happening in these cyber environments, whether it's the conversation or the coding that's going on between classes in this cyber world, or frankly, more likely, going to sources outside the university to do the kinds of informal learning. How do we design for the extent to which that is so much of what the kind of learning we're doing? And I would argue that it's essential for those of us who are teachers and those of us who are designers of universities that we do this work right now, that we actually begin the job of architecting for this hybrid university in a digital plus era, which does embrace some of the wonderful things um, that we know digital natives can do, that in fact mitigates some of the problems we know they have, perhaps around multitasking or around uh, getting overloaded with information, um, but which heads us in the right direction as universities um, and takes advantage of what uh, we know historically that we're great at. Uh, so for my part, I would like to end there and say thank you uh, for this chance to uh, uh, make a case at the beginning of the Digital Natives track. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. But I invite Thank response you from you both and exactly. on the floor, I hope. Perhaps if we stay just here for that the sounds 15 good. minutes. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, Marco, since you are also designing a university, you are actually the youngest rector worldwide of a university with thousands of contributors already. I was wondering, no, no, I'm serious. Um, if you could describe your project in, in broad strokes and then also comment on some of the questions that um, John's keynote actually raised um, mute from your particular perspective. Thank you. Uh, regarding the website where the digital native would return instead of go going always to Google, Wikipedia, I think that uh, the only website uh, I would come back uh, doesn't exist and is an artificial intelligence driven fast checker, but it's sci fi at the moment. <laughs> and we, uh, we have to work on it. Uh, regarding the, um, the TMI, the too much, too much information theme, uh, a very, very little story about that and digital native. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, a friend of mine who was, who was writing a, a review about uh, Alice in Wonderland. And you know, you have lots of reviews about Alice in Wonderland on the net. And he found one, he copied it, I think. And the last sentence was, finally, Alice in Wonderland is one of a great masterwork of Italian literature. Uh, what, <laughs> what's the, what's the, the core meaning of that? The core meaning is not that, look, this is a digital native and he used to copy reviews by the net. That's, that's not the point, I think. Uh, the point is the information overload. We have to fight with artificial intelligence, semantic stuff, uh, uh, algorithms. The, uh, the thing, another thing is what we were talking about before, the, the different perception of, of time, because that friend of mine, I think, hasn't thought a lot about <laughs> that last sentence. And, and also about these, we are talking about digital natives, but we are also talking about global natives. And globalization is something who brings you to, to read uh, Carol and, you know, you haven't lied to who switched up and said, uh, I think it's not Italian at all. So it's all this stuff together. And uh, if, you, if we, for example, resolve, manage to resolve the information overload things, stuff, we have also resolved a part of all the system of critics we every day read about digital natives. 
So that's all. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Urs. So, um, John, this mode, this um, theme of globalization, uh, you've mentioned it, you um, re-emphasized it. How would you see the challenge or possible responses by universities to, you know, address this new reality, especially, of course, part of our research also shows that digital natives are increasingly connected um, uh, across, you know, national uh, boundaries. So what are our kind of creative ways forward to make the universities more global uh, in this digitally networked environment? So as you know, this is a topic close to our collective hearts. This was a project in studying young people which we did across the Atlantic. So worse of the time was in Switzerland, had a team of people, some of whom are here, Sandra Cortese, Jan Gerlach, and we had a team of people in the United States at the Berkman Center doing this work. And in creating the study on uh, youth and technology, digital natives, um, we did it in cyberspace, right? So we used Basecamp as the environment. It could have been any other shared space. And uh, the research teams took the information and put it into a single place in cyberspace. And it was from there that we crafted a book, right? You um, then make uh, one chapter and edit another chapter and so forth as we go forward. Um, and I think this idea of being able to combine uh, ways in which young people can learn from all different uh, environments, from uh, a global network, is an essential point. Um, second, I would say that one of the arguments we tried to make in uh, Born Digital was an argument that it is a global culture. It's a culture of young people who are joined by a common set of practices, a common set of experiences in being mediated by global technologies, and that this may well be one of the commonalities that may help cross-cultural understanding. So we did our research in the northeast of the United States. We did research in uh, Bahrain in the Gulf. We did research, of course, in Switzerland uh, and elsewhere in Europe. And we did it in East Asia, in Shanghai uh, and Beijing. And it's too small a study to make a large claim about these commonalities. But what we found, of course, was among elite kids in these environments that they use technologies in very similar ways. So the possibilities for connectivity on a global level are enormous. And I think the right way to think about it from a university perspective then is to see it as the next generation exchange program in a way. So we used to have the concept that a student in her second year at the Politecnico di Torino would come to the Berkman Center and spend some time and so forth. And this is very important. We do have to get on airplanes. We do have to break bread together and have a nice Italian meal with Juan Carlos to understand the environment before we uh, teach together. But I think it's equally important that we think about the possibilities of what we do in between these meetings and how we learn uh, in this broader uh, environment. And I think the study of cyberspace, the study of internet and society, gives us great opportunity to do this. We are networked organizations as learning institutions uh, by our very existence. We are, at, we are that at our core. And I think if we can make a network, a learning network globally, that involves the study of this one topic, that we can make a case for how universities might tap into this next generation exchange program. Wonderful, thank you. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, open it up for questions and brief comments from the audience. We have about 10 minutes, just as a heads up. Someone came up and urged me to, yes, please. Please tell us your name. Thank you. I'm Oreste Caliano. I teach uh, um, computer law and internet law uh, in the uh, University of Torino. And uh, uh, thinking to my student uh, in the last 20 years, uh, there was a, a big change. The first uh, step was the B students, the, the book students. They study with uh, a, a methodology that is deductive methodology, Aristotelic methodology. Probably not the Harvard one that used the Socratic method, but here in uh, Europe, in Italy, uh, they used. Uh, and uh, uh, the second, the second uh, uh, student is the E student, uh, the student that used the computer such as my second son uh, that uh, 
is a very proud to be student of the Polytechnic of Torino and engineer, and uh, uh, as a uh, young boy played with electronic games uh, using try and learn uh, uh, inductive method that uh, gave uh, a lot of problem to us, uh, for example, for the lawyer, to use the case method to uh, introduce uh, the learning by doing, uh, the interdisciplinary method, and so on. The third kind of student now are the uh, C student, connected student, means the student uh, that uh, use social network, uh, learn by interacting, uh, use probably the abductive method, uh, using uh, metaphorical method, because they uh, speak with uh, colleagues uh, in Africa, in Australia, all over the world. So uh, this is difficult for me and for us uh, to find useful and correct uh, global metaphor, global uh, example, global case, global discourse. And probably uh, is useful a transdisciplinary method. John said us correctly that uh, uh, it's necessary to have actors, uh, uh, law actors, uh, uh, discussing with uh, uh, informatic colleagues. I say also with uh, telematic colleagues, but also cognitive science, uh, also economics, uh, sociological, anthropological science. And my problem is now, what will be the future of the organization of the science and of the knowledge, for example, for the son of my son, that is a native African, and at the age of four, use three languages and half. And probably you will use the computer as a pen, and probably is necessary to organize uh, knowledge uh, because, as you know, the organization of knowledge needs uh, 15, 20, 25 years. And this is exactly what you put at uh, uh, our attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great comment. Would you like to respond, John? No, I, I, amen. That's good. Any other comments or thoughts or questions? Yes. Do we have someone with microphones, please? Thank you. Just in the middle of the room. Hello. I want to ask to Marco just a question. Uh, if, if uh, in your opinion, there are some typical uh, characteristic, uh, not, not characteristic, values that the digital natives have and they want to, to, to share with the world, and uh, if, uh, if yes, if you, if you share, I, I have a fear that, uh, my fear is that uh, with, in the future, these, uh, uh, these values that the digital natives are taking out uh, will uh, give the place to the ancient values, the non-digital uh, age values. So I have, I have this fear that uh, at the end, in the years, we will, uh, we will. Uh, the, the digital navies are not so much strong to to they, to to give voice to their values. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have lots catastrophistic theory about battles in Italy. We have uh, uh, la fine della modernità di Eugenio Scalfari about these digital natives who are doing what you, what, what you said. Um, about values, I think that the, the third aspect I said before, which is the one about the authorities' uh, perception, is a, is a great positive value. And uh, if we manage to resolve the problem of information overload. And on the other two aspects, yes, I also have a few doubts, especially on the on the aspect about uh, the, the time, no? the, the distraction and the, the different uh, kind of attention we digital natives uh, does have. Um, 
On the second one, of the one about the, the different kind of contents we, we use, uh, I think that yes, we can, we can talk if, uh, we can talk about uh, is a video content a good content, is globally a value to use that kind of content, uh, how much value does uh, an hour on Facebook have, but is is quite complex. But on the first point, uh, the authorities, I, I think that is a, a good value. And uh, first you, you, you asked, uh, in the future, will the university be the center of instruction? Because very, <laughs> we don't have the answer, actually. And um, regarding that, I have a, a really banal answers. I don't know if you like banal answers. I do, <laughs> at the end. <laughs> And uh, I think that we are talking about a, about a globalized marketplace of knowledge. That's a marketplace because it's just one, it's worldwide, etc. And uh, in a marketplace of knowledge does win the quality, the quality stuff. And so if the real, answer, the real question is, will university manage to guarantee that great quality that will that will and and and, and the, the consequences that university will remain the center of of knowledge and destruction that's the core point and what we really must avoid is for example to have a, a great university in the states with university in the states who manage to remain the center of knowledge and in italy uh, <laughs> the opposite I don't believe this is a real problem. You have these great universities here, of course. But if I might, we're, um, just, I know we're short on time, but I, might, I think it's great to have Marco have the last word. But if I can play a video that would answer this question by way of closing. I don't know if you want to say something before I put on the video, but... Please go. That's okay. Um, so if I might end by answering uh, this question about um, the content and the way in which young people express themselves. Of course, you have the best example here in Marco and his articulateness and no bad answers. Um, but one of the things that uh, Urs and I have been trying with respect to uh, this book, Born Digital, um, was to express the book in different formats and, in fact, to have young people tell the story of the book itself. So we created a blog, and young people write blog entries that express the uh, argument of the book. We have the book in a wiki, um, and you can go and edit the arguments. Um, but the most exciting form of the book, in a way, is, uh, is in video format. And uh, uh, we've had a group of interns at the Berkman Center who have each taken uh, a chapter of the book and uh, taken the argument of it and transformed it in three to five minutes in a video. So if I might, I would love to end with the um, uh, argument for the dossier's chapter of our book. Um, you no longer have to read the dossier's chapter once you've watched this video. Um, it's by a young woman named Kanu Tawari. She was an intern uh, previously at the Berkman Center. Uh, she, in fact, Egyptian, to uh, Marco's earlier point. Her, uh, she's 17 years old at the time and had no discernible technical skills, uh, but I think she made a much better argument, and I'd love to end with it, um, about digital dossiers uh, than Urs and I did, sorry Urs, um, in our book. Just about all of us have a digital dossier, but many of us have no idea what it even is. Your dossier is the accumulation of all the digital tracks you leave behind. And this accumulation did not just start last week, month, or even year. It started before you were even born. The line between your digital dossier and your identity is constantly shifting. One way to see the implication of this movement is to imagine how information goes into the file of a child born today. Let's call him Andy. The first entry into Andy's file occurs while he's still five months into the womb. It is a sonogram, probably framed by his parents or even forwarded via email to their closest relatives. The same picture will also be copied in Andy's hospital folder and into a file for the pediatrician who will take over after his birth. As the new baby grows, so do the number of items in his digital file. Andy's barcoded bracelet lists facts like gender, time of birth, surname and more. Friends and family will come to meet the baby, bring gifts, and take more photos, probably with phones or digital cameras. These photos are then also uploaded to other Flickr feeds or Facebook albums as part of the welcoming process. Andy's parents will use their phones to spread the news with SMS text messages, saying something along the lines of, Healthy baby boy, born 6 pounds at 5.30 p.m. Friends will also post to the Flickr feeds, which will conveniently contain multitudes of Andy's pictures. 
This process of capturing and spreading pictures will continue for Andy's entire life, with pictures of the first time Andy sits, stands, walks, and talks. As Andy grows, he will now be able to independently share information about himself. Who registers as a user on Neopets, where he fills out his name, age, birth date, and other details. Half of the blanks may not be even necessary to fill out, but Andy does not notice the significance of the asterisks as described at the bottom of the page. And so, Andy grows bigger, taller, and broader, and with him grows his digital dossier. As an adolescent, he is sucked into Facebook, where he posts pictures, videos, and information about his likes and dislikes. Facebook, in turn, deposits cookies into his web browser, tracking his activities. He signs up for a Gmail account and regularly uses Google to research for information needed in school assignments. Google, in turn, keeps tabs on all the searches Andy makes from his IP address. In college, he buys books from Amazon, which asks for his mailing address and credit card number. Andy's credit card company adds even more details to his dossier. The date, time, location, and price of every purchase he makes. And as Andy moves around, the GPS in his cell phone enables his service provider to know where he is and how many times he has been there recently. He is also filmed by surveillance cameras whenever he walks into secured college buildings. When Andy gets married, his dossier expands to encompass all the information about his wife, and they start a weblog together to share their thoughts and opinions online. Together they compile shelf upon shelf of digital tracks, files that are recorded and stored under their names. And when Andy has his first baby, aptly named Andy Jr., the cycle is started all over again. These data points, some publicly accessible, others safeguarded to various degrees by companies and agencies that collect and store this data, make Andy's identity as it forms, even before he himself begins to shape it. And Andy's digital dossier will even grow after his death. Photos or videos of a funeral, RIP messages on MSN Messenger, or his Facebook status posts. Andy probably never knew how large his dossier was. How aware are you of the tracks you leave behind? Want to learn more about your digital dossier? That's advertising, John. So thank you very much. Uh, obviously, this was just the beginning of the conversation. We'll continue tomorrow. Thank you very much, John and Marco. We will continue at 2.30. And do you have lunch instructions?